I think one of the nicest things to have is just one of the devices that you can just throw in your bag and not really care about if you lose it. For a device like this, it has to be small enough to fit in your pocket, but it also has to be cheap enough that you could replace it if you lost it. My current device of choice for this is the TrimUI Smart Pro. If I lost this, it would still suck, but at least I could replace it relatively easily. This was extremely thin and very easy to fit in my pocket. I've been wondering if there was a good alternative to this. This was a good device, and I really liked it. It has a nice big screen, decent controls, and good comfort. If you haven't seen my review on the TrimUI Smart Pro, make sure to check that out. I'll leave that linked in the description below. But if you're looking for a good alternative to the TrimUI Smart Pro, well, what else is there? This is the RG40XXH. I still think Ambernick needs to work on their naming. This device here in particular interests me for a few different reasons, but I think you're going to be pretty impressed with it. Obviously, it's not a perfect device, but I still think it's worthwhile checking out. Let's open this up and take a closer look at the RG40XXH and see if it's worth it over the TrimUI Smart Pro or other budget offerings. Without further ado, let's just hop in. Just a quick disclaimer as well, this was sent over from Lit NXT. With all my reviews, the company is not seeing this video beforehand. They're not paying for this review and all opinions are my own. I'm just going to give you guys my honest thoughts to what I think about these. So what exactly is the RG40XXH? This is essentially the Anbernic SP in just a different form factor. So whatever this plays, essentially the 40XXH is going to be able to play it too. I actually was really surprised about the SP, and if you haven't seen my review of that, make sure to check that out too. First things first, let's take a closer look at the website and see what this device is. This is available on Lit NXT's website for $85.99. You can also save a little bit with my coupon code, and I'll leave that linked in the description below, along with the link if you're interested in picking one of these up. This device here comes in three different colors. We have the black, which looks pretty clean and very minimalistic. The grey looks pretty good too, I was actually really tempted to get this colour in particular, I just love that DMG style. And of course this extremely vibrant blue, this is actually the one I decided to go for just because I don't have any other blue devices. You can also get this in a couple different options too, there's the 64GB, you can get a 128GB memory card with it, or a 256 personally I would just get this without a memory card and use your own. If you want a case for this as well, they have a bundle option down here. It looks like it goes from 86 US dollars up to 89. So it's literally only a few dollars to get a case with it. I would definitely recommend picking one up with that. So as mentioned, this is very similar to the SP. You get that same H700 quad core processor. You get a dual core Mali G31 GPU, one gigabyte of LPDDR4 memory, this has a relatively small battery at only 3200 mAh. This only supports standard charging, but we'll take a closer look at that later. This also supports AC Wi-Fi with a 5 GHz band, so it should be pretty decent for streaming, and it has Bluetooth 4.2. This runs on the same Linux-style OS that the SP does. The real big star of the show is this 4-inch IPS laminated screen, which has a resolution of 640x480. 640x480 should be a decent mid-sized resolution for a 4 inch panel and I think the colors should look pretty nice too since it's an IPS screen. The box is pretty plain, it looks like most Anbernic boxes. The box tells me that I have the blue model, but aside from that, it's a pretty plain box. Let's open this up and see what comes in the box. In the box we have a generic memory card, I got the 128GB one. I'd recommend swapping this with a brand name SD card if you decide to go this route. Underneath that we have the handheld itself, and it's wrapped pretty nice in the box. Look how vibrant that blue is. The back also shows that color really nice. The only other thing that we get in the box is of course a little manual. And we have a little box here with a standard USB cable. This is only going to be USB-A to USB-C. You definitely don't want to use USB-C to USB-C to charge these. First impressions of the device are pretty good. This actually feels like a pretty decent little handheld. My hands fit comfortably on it, and I like the fact that it has the D-pad at the top because I think this device here in particular is going to be more centered to retro games. We got some clicky triggers, 
and some cookie bumpers. We have some nice rubber membrane face buttons. So just a quick overview of the device itself. We have the D-pad on the top left corner. Not really a fan of these switch style joysticks, but they're decent. We have some nice rubber membrane face buttons. They're pretty glossy, but they don't seem to show a lot of fingerprints on them. The start and select is at the bottom right corner. And there's a menu button here on the bottom left. On the top of the unit, we have our two bumpers and our two triggers. These are not analog triggers. These are just digital. We have the power button, our volume switch, a little LED notification light, our USB-C port for charging. We have a reset button up here as well and our HDMI out. On the bottom, we have stereo speakers and two SD card slots. The TF1 is for the firmware files and TF2 is going to be for the games or anything else. That SD card that I got will go in the TF2 slot. We also have a 3.5mm headphone jack in the bottom center. All in all, very nice solid first impressions. I really like this device so far. I think it looks pretty cool. So how big is this device compared to other handhelds? This is very similar to the Trim UI Smart Pro in overall design. We have the D-pads on the top left on both. The joysticks are on the bottom on both and the face buttons are on the top right. The start and select button is on the bottom right, just like it is on the 40XXH. And there's a menu button on the bottom left corner on both. These are actually really similar, wow. The Trim UI Smart Pro is 79.6mm tall. The 40XXH is very similar at 80.2mm. The Trim UI Smart Pro is much thinner at 18.4mm. Actually, it looks like the Anbernic unit is slightly thinner at 168 even if you measure up where the triggers are, this is 221 millimeters, as opposed to the Trim UI's 18.5. So this is gonna be easier to stick in your pocket just cause you aren't gonna feel those triggers. Between these two, they're just very similar. They both have rounded edges. They have the same buttons in the same spots and they're both really thin. The only device that I have that's really similar is the Retro Pocket 4 Pro. But we do have the start and select in the bottom right again, both the joysticks on the bottom, face buttons on the top right, d-pad on the top left. The only other difference though is that this one has a home button because this is Android. If you look on the top, these two look very similar. They both have that texture on their triggers and the bumpers. The power button is going to be on the tops for both. They both have an HDMI out on top. The volume button is also on the top for both. This essentially to me just feels like a mini version of the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. The Retroid Pocket 4 Pro has like a texture on the back, so it's really good at resisting fingerprints. But the Anbernic unit is not very good at resisting fingerprints. If you have a lot of humidity in your area, you are going to notice some. It's not too bad at resisting fingerprints, but you are going to notice a few, especially on this blue. I think this is going to be a lot better than the black, and I personally wouldn't recommend buying the black. How does this handheld stack up in weight wise to its closest competitors? Its closest relative, the Anbernic SP, comes out to 195.2 grams. This is not a bad weight for a handheld, but because it is much smaller, it does feel like a more premium device. The 40XXH comes out to 202.2 grams. This is actually a really good weight for something that you're going to put in your pocket. The Trim UI Smart Pro comes out to 254.6 grams. Stepping things up to something that's even heavier, the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro comes out to 275.9 grams. And just that over double the weight of the 40XXH, the Odin 2 is just huge in comparison. Next up, let's talk about the build quality. It does feel really solid. The plastic on here is very similar to what you see from other Anbernic devices. This is a very smooth plastic, but it does feel solid. Again, there is no texture on the back of this, so it does pick up fingerprints. The triggers and everything at the top look really high quality. I generally don't have any concerns with the build quality. The glass on mine is also 2.5D, so the edges are a little rounded. Speaking of the build quality, this has a 64GB Kyoxia memory card. These are made by Toshiba, so this is really good to see. Next up, let's talk about these joysticks. They're just standard style Switch joysticks, so if you've used a Switch before or many other handhelds, you already know what these are like. It's extremely rubbery, so it does attract a lot of dust. These joysticks also don't really stick out of the device very much. You can also use the Skull & Co Switch style caps on these if you want a little bit more height. Taking a look at the face buttons next, these are pretty nice. 
the rubber membrane, they feel really good quality, and they have a nice glossy finish to them. The font is also very clean, and I think this looks really nice. Do you like the design of these face buttons? I think they're pretty good. These are rubber membranes, so they do have a nice soft click to them. These are pretty small. All in all, these kind of remind me of the original Game Boy Color face buttons. I love that retro feel to them. The D-pad is also rubber membrane, and it actually feels very nostalgic. It's kind of got like a harder press to it. The arrows are kind of cut out of the D-pad, and there's a little pivot point in the center, but I would say this is a very mushy D-pad. You are going to get some false diagonals on this. Not bad, but this feels very authentic to an old retro game console. Again, this just reminds me of the Game Boy Color D-pad. A very low pivot, but rubber membrane as well, and very nice. I actually prefer this. This is also really soft and not loud by any means. This is what I prefer for a D-pad, but it really comes down to personal preference. I'm shocked how similar these bumpers and triggers are to the Retroid Pocket Port Pro. These are much clickier though, and they have a very mouse style click to them. These have a much higher pitch click the closer to the center you push, then it gets more hollow the further out you go. There's also a little bit of texture on them, and there's a nice clean font too. The triggers don't have a lot of travel, but they also have that texture on them. There's also a little bit of wobble, but this is pretty normal. You can push this trigger from any angle, and I'm not hearing any creaks or anything. This is actually very similar to the one that's on the TrimUI Smart Pro. You're just getting a little bit of extra height to it, so it feels like a regular trigger. These are pretty recessed triggers, only sticking out about 5.6 millimeters off the back. The ergonomics are pretty good. I like these rounded corners, and it gives me lots of space on the back to spread out my hands. This feels almost identical to the TrimUI Smart Pro. I would say this is better than the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro in terms of ergonomics, just because of these rounded edges. There's no grips on the back though, so your hands just kind of spread across the back. This is kind of what it looks like. All in all, not bad ergonomics. I really like this. I think the TrimUI Smart Pro is ever so slightly more comfortable just because it's a little wider, but I think these are pretty identical. If you have the TrimUI Smart Pro and you like how it feels in your hand, you're going to like this one. I think you could play this for many hours without any issue. Very comfortable. Now that we've checked out the device a little bit, let's start it up and take a closer look at the actual device itself. First impressions are pretty good actually, this panel looks pretty nice. So by default you have to click the volume every single time you want to turn down the volume, you can't just hold it down. If you've used the Anbernic SP, this is identical. You have your game rooms with all your games, you have the RA game menu, looks like there's quite a few games already on there with the 64GB one. I didn't think this would look very nice on the Game Boy Advance, but you actually get some pretty cool bezels. There's one up at the top that says Nintendo, I think that looks pretty nice. There might also be some banding, but this is just my camera. You're not going to see this in real life. Game Boy Advance in particular is going to shine on this handheld. You're going to get a nice big display, and this looks really good on here. If you turn off the RetroArch shaders, the screen is going to get more vibrant and a little brighter. This is going to give you a more traditional IPS look, and this is how I prefer to play this. So going through these menus a little bit, you have the game rooms, you have the RetroArch game menu if you want those bezels. You have an app center with a few different things that you can do in there. You have your favorites menu if you want to put anything in there. History of the games that we've played on the device so far. Search menu. This is going to be invaluable if you're looking for anything in particular. And the settings menu. I'm going to max out the brightness on mine because I like a bright, vibrant panel. It gets pretty bright even under studio lights. And it also gets pretty dark for if you want to play this at night. There's also an LED settings menu. You can shut off the RGB, which is pretty nice if you want to play this at night and you don't want to be bothered by it. There's also a few different options here. I'm probably just going to set this to a standard color, but you have to set this manually, so you're really going to be able to fine tune your color choices. This also just means that it's a lot of work to swap this between anything else. I don't think I really want to set this up right now, this is just going to take too long to scroll through here. You can also adjust the brightness of these LEDs if you really want. It's nice they give you fine controls like this to change the RGB. For the purposes of this review, I'm just going to leave it to the multicolor rainbow setting. There's a few other settings that we can change in the settings menu, like we can edit the individual RetroArch settings. You can connect to your Wi-Fi in here and your Bluetooth. You can change your icon settings or the background settings, and you can adjust the button's sound. I'm going to shut that off. You can also clear all your save states in here and your saves in general. You can reboot or shut down. 
So a very simple menu, but it works and it looks very clean. If you're looking for a device, you can just play right out of the box. This is definitely one of those devices. Now that we've turned this on and kind of set it up, let's do a quick boot test just to see how long this thing takes. Let's shut it off quick and let's turn it back on. That was actually pretty quick. I thought that would take a lot longer to start, especially with that stock SD card that they've included. Let's take a closer look to see what these speakers sound like. I don't really have any high hopes for these, but the ones in the SP were decent, so I'm expecting somewhat similar. Let's load up Cave Noir, as that's the game I like to test the sound on. So I was just starting up Cave Noir to try this out because I like this game for the sound test. But wow, look at this screen. Doesn't it just look awesome? That screen just looks incredible, and they did a really good job adding those bezels in. If you go through the Retroarch game menu, you can just hold down the volume switch and it'll turn up the volume. Let me show you what this sounds like. So I'd rate the overall speakers pretty decent. They sound good, and there was no audio distortion, but they didn't get very loud, even on max volume. I think these are definitely usable though, and for a handheld under $100, that's not bad at all. So with headphones, it does sound really good, but it sounds like it's got some sort of EQ on it or something. There's very clean audio out of this though. I only got it at 50%. That's pretty loud. I could turn this all the way up to 100 though, and it doesn't max out. There's a good range of volume. This is a solid headphone jack. Now we get to talk about one of the things that I find is a make or break for most of these Anbernic handhelds, and that's their panel. I've never been happy with Anbernic panels, but their last one that I looked at, the Anbernic SP, was actually pretty decent. And as you can see, this panel gets extremely bright. This is with max brightness, and as we saw, min brightness was pretty good too. I'm going to load up the original Streets of Rage because that has a very wide range of color on it. I find that game in particular really good to check the panels with. The bezel on Mega Drive actually looks really cool too. I've gone into the settings and I'm going to shut off these video shaders. This is going to get the screen colors as accurate as possible just on the actual panel itself. These shaders tend to mess with the brightness and the color. And a close look at the panel. This is a lot better than I was expecting. Where I find a lot of these Anbernic panels fail is on the yellows. The yellows on the old Anbernic devices that I looked at were very sandy, kind of like a washed out, desaturated yellow. But this, if you look really closely, looks much better. The screen is also extremely sharp and there's no detail loss. I like that there's no bezel on the screen too and the screen goes right to the edge. That's really cool. But yes, all in all, I do think this is a good panel. First panel comparison that I want to make is with the Anbernic SP. Both of these panels are pretty interesting, but the saturation is way better on the 40XXH. The Anbernic SP, you can kind of see this with the yellows, they don't look as vibrant. That doesn't look too bad on the SP, and I think it's good for the price. But when you compare that with the 40XXH, there is a pretty big difference. I think both of these screens are really sharp though. I just think the colors look better on this one. It's also worth noting that all the devices in this have their screens maxed out in brightness and the shaders are also off on all of these. This is just the screen with its true color. I think the screen on the Trimui Smart Pro is a little darker and the colors look a little different, don't they? I think both of these panels are excellent though. They both look really vibrant and they're decently bright. If I had to pick one of these, I think the saturation is a little tad too vibrant on the Trimui Smart Pro, but the 40XXH also looks really decent. If I had to choose between both of these, I do think that the 40XXH has a better panel. So is there anything that can compete with this panel? Of course there is. This is largely going to come down to personal preference, as with most panels. The Retroid Pocket 4 Pro has its saturation enhancement shut off. However, this panel was already known for being extremely vibrant, and that definitely shows here. 
I think the Retro Pocket 4 Pro is more saturated as mentioned, but I kind of find myself swaying towards the 40XXH. Don't get me wrong, I think this looks incredible, and this is definitely a best-in-class screen. I like really oversaturated displays, so I still do really like this one. This is one nice panel. Do you prefer the oversaturated display on the Retro Pocket 4 Pro, or do you like the more realistic look on the 40XXH? The Odin 2 also has a very oversaturated display, and I do like this screen. However, it just really comes down to personal preference. Do you want an oversaturated display or a more true to life panel? I think it's pretty hard to beat the Odin 2 in terms of color vibrancy. Only the Retro Pocket 4 Pro gives the Odin 2 a run for its money. But for the price point, the RG40XXH has one incredible screen. I think the closest competitor to the 40XXH, even in terms of screen, is definitely the TrimUI Smart Pro. I think these two look pretty dang similar. So I want to get really picky with this panel because I think everybody should know just how good a panel is. If we look very closely, this one does have some backlight issues. There's also some spots in the center part here that look like some uniformity issues, but I think this is more of a lamination issue. Green doesn't show the uniformity issues like the other one did though. I don't see any tearing or ghosting on this screen. It looks pretty good to me anyways. If I look ever so slightly, the lens is off center, but not by much. It goes up into the top corner just ever so slightly. The bottom right corner and the two sides look okay. It just looks like it goes up into the top corner just a little bit. That's not bad though. I don't see any flicker retention on this panel. It looks pretty good to me anyways, so I don't think this is going to be an issue. So all in all, that's a pretty good panel. There are a few little issues, but I'm being really picky with it just to see if those problems existed at all. Screen uniformity is a big one, and if you have a solid color, you're likely to see that little patch that was down here. It's also easier to see it on dark gray screens, but that is something to take note of. In terms of what's playable and what I think works really well on this system, there is quite a few. Game Boy is obviously going to work really well on here and it fills out the screen really nicely with this bezel. The rubber membrane face buttons also make a lot of these old systems feel very authentic. Again, I just really want to show you guys this screen with this filter. I think it looks fantastic. Game Boy Color is going to look and play great on here as well. A lot of these old retro systems, you're going to have a blast on this device. You also get a nice pixel style effect by default, but you can also shut this off if you don't like it. So yeah, game wise, you're looking at a lot of these old systems like Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Famicom, Game Boy Advance, Game Gear, Mega Drive, Neo Geo should also work good on here, Neo Geo Pocket, PC Engine, Super Famicom, Sega Master System. There's also a few ports on here as well. There's also Pico games definitely have a wide variety of games that you can play on here. PlayStation N64 and Dreamcast should also work really good on here. You might have to tinker with the settings on Dreamcast to get it working a little bit better, but for the most part, it should be pretty decent. Another benefit to playing Dreamcast on this is filling up the entire screen. I've never seen Dreamcast look this good on a handheld. I think it's really nice when stuff like this fills out your entire panel. It just makes the entire gaming experience more immersive. But because this only has digital triggers, I won't be able to play fishing games on here because you need full analog triggers for that. So this has been running a little while. Let's take a closer look at these temperatures. So anywhere from 34 to 37 degrees Celsius or just under 100 degrees Fahrenheit. This is pretty standard and I actually expected worse because this doesn't have a fan in it. Battery life on this handheld in particular is pretty decent. I would say anywhere between 4 to 6 hours is pretty accurate. You're going to get a little bit more with older titles especially if you have your Bluetooth and your Wi-Fi turned off and the brightness turned down. Standby time is also pretty decent. I would say this is pretty much on par with the SP. You're going to lose a little bit overnight but it's not too bad. On lower end emulation, you're looking at probably closer to 7 to 10 hours. I think the battery is pretty decent and I'm actually shocked it was this good for how small this battery is. This unfortunately doesn't support USB-C to USB-C charging. You are going to have to use A to C. You are getting pretty standard charging speeds on this with 4.5 volts at 1.5 amps, 6.5 to 7 watts. It's also worth noting as well that this readout on their end is not correct. This was pulling about a volt more than what their readout on the screen showed. 
6.5 watt charging is pretty standard for these emulation devices. Not bad, but nothing special. Do I think the 40XXH is worth buying? Well, I think it's a really good price for what it is. If you want something like the SP or you're new to this hobby, this is a great device to start with. You get good build quality, an excellent screen, and that screen is really bright and quite vibrant. The speakers are good enough. You're getting some really good controls and ergonomics. Overall, this is just a really easy device to recommend. I only noticed those small issues with this device when I started getting really picky and diving right into the panel. And I love this vibrant blue. If this was red, it would be even better though, at least in my opinion. Easy recommendation and excellent handheld. If I have any further impressions on this device, I'll make sure to leave a pinned comment down below. Always check there because that's the most updated information. Make sure to subscribe if you like this video as it really does help small content creators like myself. If you have any questions regarding the 40XXH, make sure to ask in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching.